Take your Bible, turn to the book of John, chapter 4, and this is, um, I'm, I am surprised I missed this. Wednesday, this Wednesday night is called, I'm surprised I missed it. Because there's a number here, and I love numbers. The numbers have meaning. There's a reason why this story of the woman at the well, and I'm going to kind of, I've, I've had something in, in my mind uh, for, for a while uh, to just kind of teach and just kind of uh, to impress on people. It's something that I've mentioned before, but it's been a, been a long time since I've taught anything like this. And I'm going to use the woman at the well and that story to, to illustrate where I'm going to go after this. But there was something in that story from the, the woman at the well. There was a number there that I, I taught all around it, mentioned it, but it didn't, it didn't catch a hold of me uh, until I went to look at it again. And I'm going, how in the world did I... I actually thought of it before I read the scripture. I thought, how many, how many husbands did, did she have? Before she met Jesus. And that number was important. And I'm going, if I'm right, I think I need to cover this. Because it's a, it, it has to do with Bible prophecy. One of the things that, that God has shown me is that these stories, even in the New Testament, they are typological shadows of things that are going to take place. And when you learn the characters, when you learn how like a man will represent either Christ or he'll represent Antichrist in some form, some fashion. A woman will represent a church, whether it's a good church or a bad church. And by the way, I want to express uh, my sincere appreciation uh, to Pastor Sims. Uh, nobody, I don't think y'all know him. Trish knew him. Um, of Rain Tree Baptist Church who preached the, the message and the graveside ceremony. I was not able to hear the message. There was standing room only there. And uh, me and Michael ended up way out in the foyer and couldn't hear. But when we walked to the, they, it was just a short walk to the cemetery where they buried her. And when he gave the graveside ceremony, I heard scripture, 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 scripture. And, uh, and I commended him. He come and stood by me after everything was done. I shook his hand. I had prayed with him before the service because I knew the challenge that he had faced preaching the funeral of a young girl like that. And um, I, I said, brother, I'll tell you what. I like you. I said, it wasn't your words that I heard to that family. And I said, it was God's words. And I said, I appreciate it. I said, that's a big thing with me. I said, if we're going to spend 40, 50 minutes holding people in a service, why waste the time telling them that what we think about it? And he agreed with me 100%. He said, give them the word of God. And I said, I've sat through whole sermons from preachers that everybody said was the greatest thing in the world. You never hardly heard, you heard scripture at the beginning. You didn't hear no more after that. And I commended him for that. And uh, just pray that God's word will do what God's word does best. And that is work in those uh, who heard it. Uh, but anyway, John chapter 4 verse 15. This woman is there at the well. And I'm not going to cover all the things I've covered before. But I'm going to focus on this particular issue, the typology of this woman is that she represents, number one, she is a Jewish woman. So she represents Israel, the people of Israel that God is going to save in the last days. And now some people have huge hangups with this. They either try using what's called replacement theology, where they say, well, the church replaces Israel. Uh, I don't believe that. I believe that we are grafted in to the, to the olive branch, to the olive tree. And that tree is Christ. 
Israel are the natural branches that were taken off because of unbelief. However, when Paul's teaching that, he said, if they believe, they are able to be grafted in again. And that is exactly, not everybody who's a Jew is going to be saved, but God has a reservation, a reserved group of Jewish people who are going to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, is the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, their eyes are going to be open just like this woman's eyes was open. What was the main thing that she discovered at this trip to the well? She discovered who the Messiah was, correct? Now look at this. Verse 15, the woman saith unto her, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband and come hither. And this was Jesus setting this, this issue up right here, knowing that she currently was not living with a man who was her husband. He knew this. But he wanted to, in my opinion, bring this particular number out in the text. Now, I get it now. And I don't know why I didn't see it before. I guess God has a time for everything. The woman, verse 17, answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast have five husbands. Again, I'm, I'm just going, Hoggard, why didn't you pick up on this? Because that number is one of my favorite numbers to study in the Bible. The other ones are 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, whatever. All the rest of them. But this is one of my favorite areas to study because this number deals with death. And this woman is dead in trespasses and sins. She has gone through five husbands. Now, and I want you to think about this. She's looking for something that she has not found yet and has not been satisfied. Exactly. Exactly. Matthew said grace. She's not found it yet. The Jews, all they know is the law, the law, the law, the law, the law. And they have not found what they have sought after. And, they, and right now, they have so nullified and made void the commandments of God with their traditions and the teachings of the rabbis for the last 4,000 years that they've practically messed up the entire Old Testament. To them, I can't even begin to explain um, the Jewish religion of Kabbalah as it stands right now. I cannot even begin to describe to you what it is they believe. It is so complicated and they have made it so difficult to understand. And in some cases, what they believe is the true doctrine, they won't even teach in books or in written form. It has to be done orally because they don't want certain teachings out for the Goyim, the Gentiles, to find out what they really believe. Okay? So anyway, and I'm just, now, now I see this woman having five husbands, I'm going, I know who she is. She's Israel. And she's dead. Okay? Um, thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast is not thy husband, and, and thou saidst thou truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. And then later on, she gets it. She comes to the understanding, this is the Messiah. This is who he is. I found, I found him. I found the one who was prophesied of. I found the Messiah. I know who it is. And that's what this story is all about. It is about Israel discovering Jesus being the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Messiah, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Son of David, the man who's going to sit on his father's, David's throne. She figures it out now when Jesus shows up and she meets Jesus for the very first time. Now, let's pray. Father, bless your word tonight. And just bless these people. Uh, Father, we pray, Lord, you'd bless uh, the Griffin family and all of those affected um, by Taylor's passing. 
Uh, Father, just do a good work in some people's lives. And Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for gathering us here tonight. We love you and we love your word. Bless it tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, very quickly, I'm just, I like to show you this, why I say what I say. Turn to Genesis chapter 5, and you're going to notice something. I've done this uh, in various ways before, but I'm going to just kind of reiterate it again tonight to show you this is what this means. This is why she had five husbands. Okay? Genesis 5. The number 5 represents death. And I'm going to show you that. Genesis 5, verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. Now, what does the Bible say about Adam versus Christ? As in Adam, we all die. But in Christ, all are made alive. Okay? So, no, and I have his name underlined in this passage. This book of the generations of Adam. And since we are born of Adam, we are born to die. As Adam dies, so we are going to die. You are not, listen, quit thinking that you're going to escape the cemetery. Because you're not. Short of the Lord appearing in the air, you're going to lay in a casket one of these days. Get, just get that in your mind. In the day that God created man in the likeness of God, may he him... Verse 2, male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam. That's the second time his name is mentioned. In the day when they were created. Verse 3, and Adam, that's the third time his name is mentioned, lived in 130 years and begat a son in his likeness after his image, called his name Seth. And in the days of Adam, verse 4, that's the fourth time he's mentioned, after he had begotten Seth for 800 years and he begat sons and daughters. Verse 5, and all the days that Adam fifth time he's mentioned, lived were 930 years, and he died. Now, this pattern is repeated. If you look at Seth now, in, starting in verse 3, Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. Number, that's one. And the days of Adam after he be, had begotten Seth, that second time, were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. There's no mention of Seth in verse 5, so we move to verse 6. And Seth... That's third time is mentioned, lived in 105 years, begat Enos, and verse 7, and Seth, fourth time, lived after he begat Enos, 807 years, and begat sons and daughters. Verse 8, and all the days of Seth, that's fifth time his name is mentioned, were 912 years, and he died. Now, I remember looking at this, and I looked at every single name in Genesis 5, and every name that's named in Genesis 5, they're mentioned five times, and it says the exact same thing about them. One, two, three, four, five, the fifth time they mentioned, and he died, and he died, and he died. There was one person, actually two, in this lineage from Adam to Noah that broke that pattern. Enoch was one of them, Noah was one of them. The fifth time Noah's name is mentioned, Matthew, you said it, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Fifth time Noah, and by the way, this only works with the King James. Because the NIV has removed one of the names of Noah. They took it out of the text. Okay? So now, Genesis 5, verse 18. And Jared lived 160 and two years and begat Enoch. That's first. And Jared lived after he begat Enoch. That's second time, 800 years, and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were 960 and two years, and he died. And Enoch, third time he mentioned, lived 60 and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch, fourth time he's mentioned, walked with God. Now, now we see a, even a difference in how it's written. Because usually by the time you get to the fourth time a person's name is mentioned, and, and Adam begat sons and daughters, usually on the fourth time. But it says here of Enoch, Enoch walked with God. After he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch, here's the fifth time he's mentioned. We're 360 and five years. Verse 24, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Enoch broke the pattern. He did not die. Enoch did not die. In fact, turn to Hebrews 11. And when you get to Hebrews 11, just count down. One, two, three, four, five verses. That ought to be easy. What verse would that be? 
I'm going to slap you. Five, fifth verse. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. So what's, what's happened is, here's number five, is number for death, but because of Christ crucifying death on the cross, taking our enemies that were against us, nailing them to his cross, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. God now gives us victory over death. In the translation, the rapture we call it, the, re the first resurrection, those who have already died get victory over death because they're brought up out of the graves, they're given a new body, and they live forever and ever and ever and never stop living. Ever. Amen. That's victory over death. But those who are alive and remain won't, at that day, won't even see death. They will just be transformed after the dead in Christ shall rise. They get to go first. It's their right. They lived their life, died out of it. it they, got, they get to go first. But then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. And, and you, I'm not going to get into all the rapture verses that show you the number five. But I'm showing you that number five deals with death. Now watch this. Turn to Romans 5. This again... This woman at the well represents Israel being dead in trespasses and sins. When God showed Enoch, not, not Enoch, Ezekiel, the valley, what was in it? Dry bones. Who were those dry bones? Israel. They were dead. It, listen, dry bones. It don't get any deader than that. You can't do chest compressions on dry bones. Okay? Can't hook up an IV to it. Can't do nothing. So what happened? He prophesied once. The bones came together. The sinews, the tissue, the skin. But they still weren't alive. He prophesied twice. Because it's going to happen at Christ's second coming. Not his first. His second coming. He prophesies again. And the four winds, four for the gospels, come in and breathe, put breath in to those bodies, and they stand up, the, the armies of Israel. Okay? They're alive now. They've been brought back from the dead. So Romans 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, Adam... So here's, here's one verse why you cannot believe that there were people living on the earth before Adam. Because according to this verse, there was no death in the world until Adam transgressed. So some people try to reconcile um, evolution with the Bible. Saying, well, yeah, I believe we could have developed from monkeys, that being the plan of God. And the Neanderthal man finally, you know, made it with the Cro-Magnon man. And they uh, finally uh, became Homo sapiens. And then the Homo sapiens lived. But Adam wasn't the first man, by, per se. He was the first man that God made a covenant with. That's, that's what they say. If that's the case, then the earth... After so many hundred million years would be so overpopulated with human beings, it's ridiculous. Because nobody dies until Adam. As by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. So death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Who sinned? All have sinned. Verse 13, for until the law... Sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from who to who? Adam to Moses. We've already seen that Adam, fifth chapter of the Bible, 
fifth verse of the fifth chapter of the Bible, having been mentioned five times, he dies. What about Moses? When did Moses die? Deuteronomy? Let's count. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. And guess what verse he died in? Just take a wild guess. Deuteronomy 34, 5. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died. That is not an accident. It's not an accident. They're in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. Okay? This Bible's perfect. I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's arranged perfectly in order. There's nothing out of order. There's nothing not right about this book. Nothing. Everything is exactly how God wants it. And you pay attention to that stuff. You get, you get wisdom that's out of this world kind of stuff. So here's this woman having had five husbands. Turn, turn to Romans 7. Romans 7 verse 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman, who did he meet at the well? A woman. A woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she should be called an adulteress. That's who this woman was multitudes of adultery. That's who she was. She was an adulterer. Did Jesus hate her for it? Understand that God loves sinners. Not self-righteous people. He loves sinners. So much that he died for them. So that if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she should be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become, now he's making it to, to us, ye are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So because of Christ rising from the dead, our marriage is to him. And there's many illustrations of that in the Bible. You remember the parable of the virgins? How many total virgins were there? Ten. But five were wise and five were stupid. Foolish. Unbelieving. Okay? They had no oil. They had lamps. They had churches. They had no oil in it. They were... Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. They had no word in there. They had nothing to light their path with. And, so they, and they got caught off guard. While they went to buy, the bridegroom came, shut the door on them. And shut them out. So who, how many of them get to go in? Five of them. You have Abigail, who is married to Nabal. He is a foolish, evil, wicked Man, he hates David. David is the type of Christ. He hates David. David's going to kill him. But he's going to kill, not just kill Nabal, he's going to kill his whole house. And Abigail would have been killed in that slaughter. And she recognizes it. Abigail is a picture of your soul that recognizes that the body and the, it, the my soul is going to follow my body into everlasting corruption. If I don't do something about it. So what did she do? She went to David who represents Christ. And bowed and prayed to him. For salvation. She, she asked David to save her. Please don't come and kill us. So David put his sword back in his sheath. And he, and he answered her prayer in the positive. You'll live. Daughter you'll live. And what happens? She goes back home. Nabal's drunk having a party. Celebrating himself. Next day he wakes up. His wife Abigail tells him that David was coming to kill him. She talked him out of it. He had a stroke. His heart turned to stone for 10 days. That's the law. 10 days. Then he dies. Abigail now is free to marry another. Just like in Romans 7. And who does she marry? David. Who does she take with her? 
her five damsels. I love this. How did I miss that? I guess God has a timing for everything. Amen. Now, turn to Leviticus chapter 1. We're going to change keys here a little bit. Now, I, I, want you, I do want you to ponder this woman's life for a little bit. Having had five husbands, again, do you feel like she was living her best life now? She had had five failed marriages. Five failed marriages. And I know, I know women who have had that many and more. I know men who have had that many and more. They never found happiness. They never found contentment. They never found satisfaction. And I'm not just talking about romance. I'm talking about the personal joy of a, of a solid marriage. They, they never had that in their life. So they said, well, I'm divorcing this guy. He's the bum. No good. So she goes out and marries another bum. Because that's what she does. And she married five of them. And the one she was with, he didn't even want to get married. I ain't, I ain't getting married. Why should I get married? Why should I, why should I give you half my stuff in the divorce? Because that's where it's headed because you've been there five times already. And what, one of the things this woman realized is that sin always has a price. A heavy one. Leviticus chapter 1. Leviticus is the third book of the Bible. Levi was the third son of uh, Jacob. And there's, it's sort of a proto, it's, it's a foreshadow of the New Testament. There are 27 chapters in Leviticus. That's 3 times 3 times 3. 27 books in the New Testament. Okay? So what you have here is a picture all of the the book of Leviticus is all about how the Levite priests were to sacrifice the animals so now watch this Leviticus 1 verse 2 speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them if any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord you shall bring your offering of the cattle even of the herd and of the flock if his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd which would be an ox or big cow, big bull, or whatever. Let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. This male without blemish. We understand it's a picture of Christ who could not have any sins. Okay? And the idea that it was the male without blemish. God, and he's repeated this over and over to Israel. Do not bring me your sick and your nearly dead sheep, goats, oxen, doves. I don't want them. You got a, you got a lamb that's about ready to die and you're going to come offer that to me for a sacrifice. All you're doing is trying to get rid of it. So it doesn't infect the rest of you. You're not giving me your prize bull. You're giving me the one that is worthless to you anyway. And God's not going to have it. And by the way, as Moses lays this law out, it's just like with the Passover. God told Moses, when you, you, here's how you're going to do the Passover. And he said, you're going to do it every year. Next year, you're going you're to reenact this thing. And he said, your children are going to ask you, Daddy, what, why, why do we do this? Why do we go through this ritual every year? In verse, um, verse 3 again, If his offering be a burnt sacrifice to the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. 
And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. In other words, that, that man, the head of that family, was laying, he was discharging the sins of himself and his family to that ox, to that bull. So those sins are taken away from him. And it shall be accepted, and it shall make an atonement for him. And he shall kill the bullock before the Lord, and the priest Aaron's son shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood round about upon the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So here's this man. So I want you to get this image. He takes his prized bull. Puts a rope. He's got a ring around it in its nose. And he hooks onto that ring. It's easy to pull a bull with that ring in its nose. And they're taking that bull, leading that bull. That bull doesn't know what he's, where he's going. And the man's children are following him to the door of the tabernacle. And the man says, son, come with me. I'm going to teach you something. Daddy, where are we taking this bull? That's our best bull. Son, I'm going to show you something. And he takes it to the door of the tabernacle. And he lays his hand upon the head of the bull. Discharges the sins of him and his family. On their prize, number one, head of the herd. And the son says, Daddy, why do we have to give up the best of our flocks? Why do we have to do this? And the father then says to his sons, his children, Son, I want you to understand something. It'll make sense later on down the road. But I want you to learn it from an early age. Your dad disobeyed God. Your mom disobeyed God. You, even in your youth, you disobeyed God's commandments. You lied to your mom the other day. Okay, you cheated on something. I lied to your mom the other day. I have sinned in the eyes of the Lord. And son, I want you to understand something. That our sins have a heavy price to pay. I'll never forget when brother, brother Ed testified that Sunday morning after the Michael Brown shooting. And he said, I'm going to tell you what, he said, I'm going to tell you what this is about. He said, the kids in our neighborhood are taught from the earliest age, hate white people, hate cops, distrust authority. If you get in trouble, we'll, we'll get you out of it. And you have, and it's not just in the black community. Even in the white families. They try to constantly, it's the cop's fault, it's the cop's fault. The cop shouldn't have pulled my son over. What did you do and pull my son over? Why did you do this? But it's, it's a horrible situation. We're raising children that have never learned that their wrong actions have a penalty that someone has to pay. I mentioned a few weeks ago that we used to teach citizenship in our public schools. What that means is we used to teach, the teachers used to teach the children in the school how to share, how to be courteous, how not to uh, call other people names, how not to do this, how not to do that. In other words, teaching them a, to be responsible American children so that their life now is not spent being under government control, either in the prison or the welfare system, or whatever it was. But we have failed in this country to teach generation after generation after generation of children that sin always has a heavy price attached.
to it. Always. So that's, that's, that's just one out of Leviticus. Turn to Joshua chapter 7. Every, every grandpa, grandma, mom, dad, aunt, uncle, here and out in the internet world, don't you listen to this. God sent word to Joshua, Joshua, give these instructions to the people. When we go invade Jericho, the walls are going to fall down. When you go inside, you instruct everybody, whatever they see in those people's houses, leave it. I'm not sending them in there to steal what's, in, what's inside Jericho. You tell them to keep their hands off of it. What did Achan do? He violated the law of the Lord and thought he could get away with it. What good does it do to steal something if you have to hide it for the rest of your life? Because he stole a garment. Is he ever going to be able to wear that garment? Never. Ever. So, to make the story short, uh, story short, <laughs> verse 20, And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. Now let me ask you a question. Did Achan's wife put him up to this? We don't have no record of that. Did Achan's children say, Daddy, if you get in Jericho and you see something get it for me we have no record of that either but watch what happened verse 21 when I saw among the spoils of goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight then I coveted them and took them and behold they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it and in verse 24 the Bible says and Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah and the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold, and his sons, and his daughters, and his oxen, and his asses, and his sheep, and his tent, and all that he had. And Joshua said, and, and brought them into the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones, and burned them with fire. His Achan had to stand there and watch as large stones were being thrown at the skulls of his children. Achan found out that sin not only cost him his life, his sin cost his children their lives. This, we serve the same God, by the way. He's, he's not grown up and changed his attitude. He is the same God, people. And they raised over them a great heap of stones unto this day, so the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger, wherefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. Sin. My sins. And my wife's sins we know for a fact have had an effect on our children. We know it. They may not know everything we've done, recognize it, but we know it. And it kills us. And then the effect on our grandchildren. God, God said, I'll do it to the third and fourth generation. Sin always carries with it a very high, steep price. And it is a price that we find out too late is too high for us to pay. Proverbs chapter 40, 14, verse 34. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Sin will cost you your reputation. Now, as after 2009, 
when we started putting all the things we do on the internet and our ministry has grown and our outreach has grown and the number of sheep in our flock has, in, has increased, the number of people that, I got letters on my desk right now that just bless my heart. Pastor, we love you. Keep doing what you're doing. We, keep, we love that King James. We've learned, we've learned so much. Pastor, we pray for Bethel every day. Keep doing it. Because I'm telling you, the devil would love to get me and destroy me publicly. Getting me caught in some great big sin scandal. And having to drag this whole church through that, like that church in Oklahoma, where the pastor and his wife was having threesomes with that guy. That church's reputation is gone. Their sin, that pastor's sin, was a reproach to his entire church. His entire church. 2 Samuel 12, turn there. It'll cost you your reputation. It'll cost you money. How much money, how much money in this country is spent on alcohol rehabilitation, drug rehabilitation? Prisons? The prison system itself? Courts know that they can't literally put everybody in prison that breaks the law. They just can't. There's not enough prison. So they, the socialists have come up with these social programs to try to help people. And 80% of the time it fails. I'm just guessing on that number. But I, I, I sat when Steve was still alive. He wanted me to go to court with him one morning. To answer to some charges. And I sat and watched one juvenile after another come in this court. I say juvenile. They obviously were over 18 because it was a, an adult court. But it was young men, one after another, who the judge was saying, okay, probation, 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 probation. And just kept moving them through like cattle. Probation, probation, probation. Don't do this again. Probation, probation, probation. Yes, sir. Yeah, I believe it. I believe it. And it, it takes its toll. It takes its toll on your health. So that now we're, now we're, we're putting our problems on the health care system of our country. Our sins... How many people, heart attacks and lung cancer because of cigarettes? How many people in and out of the hospital over here because of various sinful activities? Now they're telling us, I read something on KMOV today, that the, what is it, the trout, the, what is it, the salmon in Branson at uh, Lake Tenicomo? where they had that hatchery there, they're saying now that because of the methamphetamine use in the state of Missouri, and it's passed into the sewage systems across the state of Missouri, goes into the water that a lot of the fish are affected by it, and these fish now are getting hooked on, because they've tested them, they said the fish that we, that we tested and we had different settings set up we took the fish out of the water they were in and put them in fresh clean water and after about four days they wanted back in the meth infected water I'm telling you sin costs 2 Samuel 12 verse 9 this is to David. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword, watch this, the sword shall never depart from thine house. 
And that, from that moment forward, David's family, they fought and killed one another. Absalom, uh, uh, Amnon raped his own sister. Absalom killed Amnon. Then Absalom tried to steal his father's throne, actually did it for a while, slept with his father's concubines on the roof of his, of his father's house in the sight of all Israel. And God said, this, I'm going to do this to you, David. The sword will never depart from your house. God withheld that judgment till after Solomon died. And after Solomon died, the sword divided the kingdom of Israel into two different countries. There was a civil split. And they hated each other. They hated each other for years. Uh, the sword shall never depart from thine house. And because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. And I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor. And he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, the Lord also hath put away thy sin and thou shalt not die. Yes, he will forgive you. How be it? Because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The, ch the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. An innocent child had to pay for David's sins. Now, next time you start asking, why did God, why did you do this? Maybe the answer is something you don't want to hear. Maybe the answer is, God would say to you, do you remember what you did in the sight of the entire world? This is why I did this. Sin has a price, people. Romans 5, for we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. This price, God had to pay with his only begotten son. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Corinthians 15, 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. The innocent dies for the guilty. Now, I'm not saying that Every time somebody dies, it's, well, death itself is the result of our sins. As by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin. Therefore, since we're of Adam, and we have sinned, then we also must pay the price that Adam paid. We must not only did Adam himself die, but he had his second son murdered by his first one. That happened just not too long after they got kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Already the first man on the earth is recognizing that sin has a price to pay. Even forgiven sins. The things that we have lost, the opportunities that maybe I could have had or you could have had, the things that you will never get back in this life that God took from you because of your sin. Now there's grace in that and God would love to give you the grace but understand someone's got to pay the price. Someone does. 